When we ask ourselves the question, where does the kettlebell come from? We usually do a simple search on the internet. In most cases, we usually find the same answers. In the early 1700s, the word kettlebell or giria appeared in Russian dictionaries as a training tool. Russian farmers used their scale weights to swing them around, eventually leading to the development of modern kettlebell training. The original and most significant techniques come from Russia. The kettlebell subsequently became the secret weapon of Russian wrestlers, soldiers and special units while the West seemed to be completely oblivious of their existence. The greatest number of kettlebell exercises were invented in the last 20 years. Now unfortunately, most of these notions already established in the collective thought do not completely align with documents, evidence and history. And that is what we will discover in this video. Grüezi miteinander, Gregory von Lebestag hier. We're all about kettlebells, so if you are into kettlebells, then like the video and consider subscribing. The objective of this video is to bring us as close as possible to the true origins of the kettlebell. Geronimo Milo, who I consider a friend who shares the same enthusiasm for kettlebells like I do, undertook the titanic task of collecting, translating and interpreting books, texts, publications, photos and stories dedicated to the kettlebell over the last 300 years. This video is, among others, heavily influenced by Geronimo's book, Kettlebell Secret Files, which I have linked in the description. As a disclaimer, we do not pretend to know everything about how it all went down, yet we believe that we have come pretty close to the truth. We want to establish a chronological timeline until the beginning of the 20th century. Even though we present to you a massive amount of documents and historical proof, we want to make clear that we are willing to revise, adapt and alter our statements if new compelling evidence is presented. Many of us are probably familiar with the fact that the ancient Greeks used so-called halteres to build godlike physiques. This demand of physical activity arose as human beings slowly abandoned their origins as hunters and gatherers. So while lifting objects has been done even in ancient times, the origins of the kettlebell can be traced into a different timeline, starting somewhere between 1800 and 1880. While it seems to hold true that the predecessors of the kettlebell we use today were used as scale weights on global markets, we want to turn our eye to the geographical locations of where it all began. Interestingly enough, we can conclude that the Europeans, namely the Germans, Austrians, Polish, French and English, contributed the most to the popularization of kettlebells, weight training and strength athletics in general. Amazed by massive feats of strength from European strongmen and strong women, pivotal figures of Tsarist Russia decided to travel throughout Europe to learn more about this new art of strength and physical culture. Their findings seem to be the most fundamental reason as to why the kettlebell was further cultivated in Russia as we will discover later in the video. This predisposed focus on kettlebells of great Russian teachers, bringing some sense of order, structure and method to the madness, would perhaps make a difference in the future of this tool in Russia. While it may be true that farmers all over the world started tossing around scale weights for fun on fairs even before any type of strongman appeared, we do not have any evidence for it. Now in order to understand the chronological structure of where it all began, we will classify the men and women responsible for the proliferation of physical culture into three groups. The originators, ranging from the end of the 18th century to around 1860. The classics, ranging from 1860 to 1900. The neoclassics, ranging from 1890 to around 1930. In the German Turner movement, we find the first description of weight training exercises similar to those performed with spherical objects, weights and equipment of similar nature. Johann Friedrich Gutzmutz was one of the first great physical training theorists of this period. Mutz exerted great influence on Friedrich Ludwig Jan, who would eventually become the father of German gymnastics. It is in this period that the grandfather of physical culture appears, Felice Napoli from Italy. He is considered the precursor of many of the exercises used by strongmen and physical culturists of the following generation. Presses, carries and holds, such as the bras tendus, are the only records that come from this period and timeline. Now while we can certainly say that Felice was handling clubs on a regular basis, 
We cannot say for certain that he used some form of spherical weights in the manner of a kettlebell. Yet, our assumption that Felice probably trained with some sort of kettlebells isn't far-fetched. Many physical culturists who use club bells are also drawn to similar types of equipment that come from the same family. We are foolish to assume that lifting heavy objects was an activity exclusively reserved for men. Elise Serafine Luftmann was probably the first woman to engage in power juggling and lifting ring weights. She is perhaps the first person to be portrayed lifting a tool relative to the kettlebell. Originally from Bohemia, Germany, she was a performer who made appearances throughout Central Europe, famous for lifting heavy objects and for power juggling with cannonballs. Hans Steidel was born in Munich, Germany in 1849. In the photo, we see him lifting a stone weighing more than 200 kilos and a 23 kilogram ring weight or kettlebell with an outstretched arm. In the classic period, ring weights or Kugelgewichte were referred to what we now call kettlebells. As far as we know, this might be the first recorded photo of someone lifting a spherical shaped kettlebell. One of the most important figures of physical culture is the legendary Professor Attila from Germany. He is probably the first person to perform feats of strength with spherical shaped weights that look a lot like the kettlebell we use today. Attila's contribution was so important that we have to list his accomplishments in 8 designated bullet points. Number 1. He made an invaluable contribution to the physical culture movement in Europe and the United States during the late 18th century. Number 2. He pioneered the use of weight training to improve performance in professional athletes. Number 3. He pioneered personal training for the rich and famous. Number 4. He was an important promoter of equal opportunities for women in sports. Number 5. He publicly argued that weight training slowed the aging process almost 100 years before the medical community came to the same conclusion. Number 6. He was the mentor and trainer of legendary Eugene Sandow. Number 7. He was the originator of the bent press. And number 8. He was the first to introduce loading a barbell with discs as weights, universally used today. Eugene Sandow is considered the father of modern bodybuilding and the first bodybuilder in history and also probably the first person to perform the snatch with a kettlebell. His iconic pose features a kettlebell where he holds it overhead standing in some form of a lunge to show off his physique. While he was not the first strength athlete and certainly not the strongest, Sandow was the first to perform in shows where the goal was to show off the muscles. Theodor Siebert also mentions in his book The Catechism of Athletics from 1899 that Sandow was equipped with a handsome face which gave him a considerable advantage that he consciously utilized with his skill as a marketer. We can say that Eugene was to bodybuilding what Pavel Tatsulin was to the kettlebell. Eugene Sandow's training books were the gateway to physical exercise for millions of people around the world at the beginning of the 20th century. Having inherited great muscular strength from his father, Charles Pata from France took advantage of this ability. He thus decided to bet on making a living out of lifting weights and showing off feats of strength. Bata was the first creator of novel types of lifts that later on were copied by many other artists including the Turkish getup. Professor De Bonnet gives his account on Bata's performance in his book The Kings of Strength. His exercises are really a novelty. Lifting weights is the ABC of any athlete. However, we can see Bata lifting two 20 kg balls with the left arm while holding a third 20 kg ball in the right arm. These feats might be challenging but seems like a child's game for Bata.
Frenchman Apollon Louis Uni had no specific or order training. He was simply dedicated to beating any of the strongman records of his contemporaries. In a series of performances, he met and received praise from the greatest exponents of physical culture of the time, such as Charles Pata and Eugene Sandow. Apollon did not develop a method or way of training, only his weightlifting photos remain. And in the photos of the book, The Kings of Strength by Debonet, we find these photos where he shows a difficult version of the bras tendu with kettlebell. Emil Voss was a famous strongman of Polish origin who carried the title the world's strongest man. He also formed a duo with another legendary character of physical culture named Pitla. Emil's typical circus act was power juggling 16 and 32 kg kettlebells. Even though power juggling seemed reserved for strongmen, it seems likely that it's probably the first style of any type of regular kettlebell training. In 1887, Dr. Krajewski, one of the most influential physical culturists of his time, as we will learn later in the video, invited him to a circle of athletes to demonstrate his lifts. Voss quickly became a coach at the doctor's gym and a fundamental influence in the development of the techniques later popularized by Krajewski himself. Theodor Siebert was a German pioneer of weightlifting and physical culture. His book, Catechism of Athletics, that was first released in 1899, had a tremendous impact on strength training and strength athletics in general. In his work, he not only listed the most famous contemporaries from that time period and their feats and records of strength, he also shared valuable insights on using a regular, periodized training system with detailed weight recommendations and exercises. The word Kugelgewicht which means kettlebell in English, is frequently mentioned in the exercise form of curls, cleans and snatches. He pioneered the pistol squat and mentioned in his book that he is striving for a global appreciation for weightlifting and feats of strength. If this worldwide acknowledgement would ever be the case, he would be more than delighted. If Theodore is watching us now from heaven above, he would probably walk around in front of the pearly gates with a huge smile on his face. Siebert's influence was also felt in one of the most influential figures in kettlebell training that we will talk about next. Dr. Krajewski was the first person to set up a rigorous training system implemented on the basis of scientific backgrounds. As the personal physician of the Tsar, he was able to exert great influence in Tsarist Russia. An influence that might explain why kettlebell training became a part of Russian culture. Krajewski included kettlebells in his gym on the premise that they are the only satisfactory tool for combating the unhealthy conditions of modern life and we must remember that health is a natural companion of strength. The German influence on the general techniques of both kettlebells and barbells is undeniable. Krajewski mentions them as a source of inspiration in his books. His openness to new ideas led to the development of using the kettlebell as a training tool in Russia. The legendary Georg Hackenschmidt, who was a student of Krajewski and will be mentioned later in the video, described many of the attributes of the good doctor in his book, The Way to Live. His strict way of life as a physical culturist. His willingness to help everybody extending his knowledge and care even to those who couldn't afford his counsel. His genuine emotion and enthusiasm for feats of strength that spread to everyone being in the same room as him. On the point of his unfortunate death, the world of physical culture lost one of the greatest contributors whose legacy is still felt today. Polish Pitla, like many of his contemporaries, engaged in Greco-Roman wrestling and won 794 out of 800 professional fights. He became one of Krajewski's coaches and contributed much to the then still emerging world of kettlebell training. His book, Podnejo Je from 1930, contains an entire chapter for some form of kettlebell exercises which are not spherical, but cylindrical. Pitla calls them watering cans and treats them as if they were kettlebells. The amount of original techniques Pitla came up with is astonishing. Cleans, push press, long cycle, jerk, curl and press, two hands anyhow, or the Swiss lift. Most of them have been perceived as modern techniques, while certain kettlebell exercises were already in use, such as the snatch or particular bottom-up variations.
Arthur Saxon from Germany was a powerful strongman who performed feats of strength with his brothers as the Saxon Trio. He's also considered a famous contributor to the world of physical culture for his feats, as well as for writing the following two books. The Development of Physical Power in 1905, an advanced book that included workouts with barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, and weight tools of the time, such as weighted rings, square weights, and refillable spheres or balloons. The Book of Weightlifting in 1908, which is an innovative work for the time that explains techniques on a scientific and psychological basis. Georg Hackenschmidt, son to a German father and a Swedish-Estonian mother, was a famous wrestler, weightlifter, writer and sports philosopher, recognized as the first world heavyweight champion in the history of Greco-Roman wrestling. I personally consider Hack, who was also called the Russian Lion, as one of the most important neoclassics of his time. His feats of strength were incredible, and his wrestling career was stellar to say the least. He also pioneered the bench press, and his book The Way to Live from 1908 is considered one of the classics of physical culture, and most of its contents are still relevant today, just like Seabot's book from 1899. You're probably familiar with the Hack Squat, which is attributed to Hack, yet Pitla also shared these type of exercises in his books. Since Pitla was older and his type of squat was the norm in that period, I have another theory as to why they called it the Hack Squat back then. Here's my assumption as a native German speaker. Hacke is a German colloquialism for the word heel. It may be that with the original old school type of squat, guys probably yelled each other to lift the heel which would mean nimm die Hacken hoch in German. This might have been the reason they started allocating the word Hack to the squat. Ivan Lebedev, better known as Uncle Vanya, was a famous public figure and another pioneer in weightlifting. He was not only a friend and coach of Krajewski's circle of athletes, but also a profound writer who, in memory of Krajewski's passing, founded the School of Physical Culture. Alongside Pitla, he's responsible for creating all types of exercises with kettlebells. In addition to being a teacher, public speaker and trainer, he wrote several books on physical culture, Strength and Health, A Guide on How to Be become a strong and healthy person in 1912, weightlifting, a guide on how to develop your strength by exercising with heavy kettlebells in 1916, exercises with weights from 1928, and gymnastics with dumbbells from 1930. He believed that everybody can and should be strong and noted the benefits of kettlebell exercises as follows. Since not all cities have amateur athletic societies with a good selection of heavyweights or barbells, all attention should be paid primarily to working with one, two and three poots. Poot being a weight unit used in Russia, leading to the fact that he strongly advocated for kettlebell use. In previous years we trained with kettlebells no less than with barbells and training with kettlebells gave incredible results when the athlete switched to the bar. Since all kettlebell exercises are much more difficult after them, the bar seemed very easy to us. Here we have the first description of the modern what the hell effect or as I like to call it, the kettlebell effect. I hope with this video, Geronimo and I were able to provide you with evidence and proof of the true history of kettlebells. While we know that the kettlebell has become a solid staple in Russian culture, we cannot, and in fact we must not forget that if it wasn't for all those European strongmen and strong women, kettlebell training probably wouldn't even exist today. It's simply a part of human nature to forget our history and where we come from. Which might explain as to why people in the West were amazed when the kettlebell was reintroduced in the 2000s by Pavel, easily being sold on the idea that it must be a secret weapon introduced by a foreign man from a foreign land. Yet, the reality seems to be that the establishment of kettlebell training in the beginning of the 21st century wasn't a revolution but rather a renaissance and that it didn't conquer brand new and unknown territory but rather re-entered familiar domains finally circling back to its place of origin. On a final note it's interesting to see that even back in the old school strongman days competition and rivalry sometimes led to unhealthy tribalism. Here are two notable examples Hackenschmidt having beef with Lurich in a public feud and Professor Attila claiming that his pro J. Sandow stole his successfully implemented training system. Unfortunately, these tribal wars can still be seen today, which leads me to believe that this type of behavior is deeply endowed in human nature. There are
are many more legendary physical culturists who contributed to the growth and popularization of strength training. Expect a future video where we will cover the distance between 1900 and the modern era that we live in today. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, like it and consider subscribing. Now, there's two more things that I want you to do. Number one, buy the book for my brother Geronimo Milo. You find the link in the description under the links section. Number two, share this video with everybody you know, with your kettlebell friends, with your kettlebell circles, because we want to honor and appreciate those who went before us. If it wasn't for them, we probably wouldn't even have kettlebells today. 90 Days of Kettlebells is an online workout course for beginners who want to train at home, lose weight and achieve lasting results without wasting time and money with crash diets and unused gym memberships. The program works as follows. You will do three kettlebell workouts per week that gradually increase in difficulty. You'll also build three powerful eating habits that have proven successful in our coaching. As the name implies, the program lasts 90 days and you will have lifelong access after purchase. We also include live accountability sessions where you will publicly state your goals. Psychology shows us that if we make our goals public, our adherence to the process and the program increases dramatically. If you have been struggling to put together an elaborate kettlebell workout system while trying to lose weight, then 90 days of kettlebells is for you. The price of 90 days of kettlebells is 59 US dollars per month for three months and you can save 20% with a one-time payment of 147 US dollars. We'll open registration only to a small number of new clients. Join the waiting list now to get access 24 hours before the general public. Link is in the description.